if anyone knows if anyone knows the despair of having too much hope, it's Kerry. Being the youngest of nine children with a father, father who was a hoarder, Kerry grew up amongst much clutter. And with her husband in the defence force, she's moved 15 times over 22 years, including a major uphaul to live overseas in the United States. After packing, unpacking, purging, and organising all her possessions so many times, Kerry certainly understands how stressful it can be. But this is the important part. She's developed many decluttering and organisational strategies along the way to make it easier. Kerry is an author, speaker, professional organiser, interior stylist and Feng Shui consultant. Her list of accomplishments to date includes over 23 years experience in decluttering and organising, a diploma in interior design. She's trained as a professional organiser by Australia's first accredited expert professional organiser. She is a member of the Australasian Association of Professional Organisers and the National Association of Professional Organisers. She trains as a Feng Shui consultant with Australia's leading real-world Feng Shui practitioner. She is the secretary for the Association of Feng Shui Consultants International. She's a volunteer with RSPCA. <laughs> Kerry is passionate about helping people around the world create the homes they love. Not only creating harmony in the home, but harmony in all areas of their lives. I welcome Kerry Rodley. Thank you, John. Beautiful. Thank you, um, Kerry, and also a big thank you to Christine and Vanessa from Communify for asking me to come along. Um, oh, now, I am filming on my little flip camera um, here because um, <laughs> because what I'm aiming to do is also to share my presentation with other others that couldn't make it um, to the conference, and I think sort of just giving them some tips and some strategies that may help. Um, you know, your friends, your family, other people that you might know, um, and I think um, Communify or um, other people might be putting it on um, for them to share with their, with their clients and things as well. So, thank you very much. Now, can anyone, it, it's, it's a hard room to work this one. You've sort of gone all the way down here and down here, but hopefully everyone can, um, can see my slides and, and um, hear what I'm saying pretty well and not in anyone's way. Um, but... When I come to um, give talks about what I do for a living, a lot of people haven't even heard of what a professional organiser is. They've never heard of professional organising. It's some sort of strange um, industry that sort of just evolved out of nowhere. So I just want to give you a little brief overview of how I came to be a professional organiser. I'm the youngest of nine. Yes, nine and them, but we weren't Catholic. Um, obviously, not Catholic. <laughs> My mother liked having babies, apparently, but there I am as number nine. Uh, we lived in a house in Sydney that had one boys' bedroom, one girls' bedroom, and one bathroom. So you can imagine my mother would have had to be extremely organised. So I probably got my organising skills from her. <coughs> but uh, just to be on the other end of the scale, I actually am the daughter of a hoarder. And it's funny, I was just talking to, to Graham um, a minute ago. It wasn't until listening to um, Professor um, Michael's uh, talk this morning that... I realised actually by the end my father was living in squalor, but of course when he's your father and it's just sort of, you know, you don't get to see the sort of degradation, just, it's just there, you, you know, it's, you're just accepting for what he is. Um, but I realised it's probably now in hindsight a lot more serious than I, than I thought, you know, and he's keeping pet rats because they come into the house and, you know, he, he likes to keep them company as we are just talking about, you know, possessions and, and pets and things like that. But that's his, that's his dog, who is his best, um, best friend. But yeah, so this is the sort of uh, way I grew up. I grew up in a house where um, I, you know, it was always messy. I just didn't, really didn't think much of it. Um, and it wasn't until Mum died that Dad pretty much then went to town because he didn't have Mum there to go, no, no, don't bring that home, go and tidy up this, do that, do whatever. So with Mum out of the way, so to speak, um, he was left to, to, to free reign. And... Um, Again, another point that um, Michael made this morning about um, people with these sort of hoarding tendencies, they're very creative. So, yes, he used to go to Vinnie's and pick up the, the, the art and all the different knickknacks and have them around the house. He used to also go down to the beach and grab giant um, bits of seaweed and start hanging them from the ceiling as like art installations. He would have um, collections of driftwood or feathers and all sorts of, you know, bits from nature. And he would have them around the house as art. And actually, he was way ahead of his time. He was a very, very creative man. Uh, but obviously, as, as time went on and sort of more the, the dementia um, did start to, to kick in, things sort of got a bit more out of control and it sort of, you know, he liked to hang on to things just because they might come in handy or in the end, I don't think he 
it was just the way he lived, so he didn't even notice. So, but yeah, so we met just at the time, didn't really know, and that wasn't why I got into the industry that I'm in now, it's just sort of evolved. Uh, but it's interesting to now reflect back on, on the way I was brought up and, and the situation and go, ah, oh, okay, that might have a bit of a clue there. Um, as mentioned, as Kerry mentioned, I, um, I am married to someone in the Army. If anyone knows of anyone in the Defence Force, we move around quite a bit. So every two to three years, it'd be packing a house, unpacking a house, moving, dealing with all the Telstra and all those sort of people, which is a lot of, a lot of fun. So I probably got, again, I got um, into the habit of decluttering because once you're moving home all the time, you really have to be going through your stuff. Do I really need to be taking this with me? Am I taking all these boxes of books, you know, when it didn't have to be? So really you do get into the habit of, of decluttering um, when you have to keep on the move. Your house doesn't build up a lot because you're not in the house for very long. And one of the moves we did go to was to the United States. And again, I am moving back over there in, in December of this year. So it's... Um, the industry over there is huge. I mean, anyone who watches Oprah knows that there's a whole, um, you know, she has her own professional organiser over there, Peter Walsh. There's a plethora of shows. The whole um, ingrained thought of simplifying and keeping things, you know, with the whole GSC and everything that's happened over there, a lot of people are looking towards, you know, what are ways that I can improve my life? Is it by getting rid of things? Is it just by, you know, downsizing? What can I do? So, although Australia is sort of slowly catching on, the Yanks are way ahead of us in, in, this, in this regard, in this sort of industry. So, while I was there, I thought, oh, you know, who knew this sort of thing was happening? This is something that I'd really like to do. So, when I uh, moved back to Australia, my husband and I moved back to Australia, I actually, all I did was type into Google, professional organiser. That's all I did. And up to pop the association of professional organisers. I went, what the hell is that? And off, off I went, and that was the, you know, that was the sort of got me on the, on the way. And I've just been learning through, um, obviously I've, I've done training and whatnot, but every client I have is so different, and every situation that I have, I learn just as much from them as they do from me. And that's what I, I find fascinating about the work I do, because no one is ever the same. There's, everyone has their different reasons, everyone has their different ways that they, you know, living in their homes, it's, it's absolutely fascinating stuff and you just have to get in there and adapt and, and, and be very flexible, so. But today I'm going to be quickly talking about um, pretty much what Michael was talking about this morning. Thank you, Michael, for that great synergy, that great lead-in, giving all the, all the theory. So mine is, is a similar sort of concept, but I'm taking the theory that Michael uh, presented this morning and I do it on the front line, so I'm pretty much doing the walking the talk, which is... Um, which is, again, how we, how we learn. But just to give you a quick overview, um, just a few steps. It, I'm going to be talking about, you know, what you need to do before you start, how to prepare them, the processes that I use, um, some little tips and tools, which is also very always very handy to um, keep in the back of your mind. Again, Michael was talking about getting organised. It's not just about decluttering. It's about helping them to be organised as well because it's about making sure the systems work for them after I leave. Um, monitoring them, and if I've got time, some case studies. So, Kerry, just feel free to, you know, tell me to... <laughs> oh, I've got a that's true. Um, okay, this is, and this isn't rocket science. You pretty much would know all of this sort of stuff, but I'm just going to go through and share with you how I work, and then uh, maybe share some examples. So, when I'm called up to do an, a, um, to come and do a consultation, the first thing I'll go out and do is go and meet the client. Now, I call them clients because, to me, they are. They're a client. It doesn't matter if they're just a person who wants their wardrobe organised through to someone with stage five uh, hoarding. So they're all the same for me. They're a client. So I go and visit them in the home and I spend at least an hour with them having a cup of tea and just getting to know them and getting, more importantly, getting them to know me because it's all about that trust and making sure that they are happy for me to come into the home and literally be touching all their personal stuff because it's so... It's just, like Michael said, it's very, very personal. So the fact that I can start that rapport, and also I need to find out why they are in that situation. So, okay, did they recently, you know, have they lost their job? Was it a marriage breakdown? Did they have kids? And then their sort of life has just become disorganised that way. What is the cause of the problem? Because until you find out the reason why, it doesn't matter how much you do clutch or organise, do whatever for them, they're going to go back to that same way unless you also are tackling the under, underlying cause. Again, they have to want you to be in there. 
Um, you might see on those hoarders shows where you, yeah, they put their hand up saying, okay, I'll be on the, on the show and I actually know the professional organiser who works on that show. But they have to also be able to um, allow you to be doing the process. It's very hard to go into someone's home who doesn't want you there. Um, I do have a client at the moment uh, where it's because he's going to be evicted um, that I'm there. We've got to try and clean up his house, otherwise he's back out in the street where he came from. And he doesn't want me touching his stuff whatsoever. He grabs me by the arm and says, come on, come and have a cup of tea with me. Let's have a chat. He's the nicest fellow. And he loves to have a chat and a cup of tea. But as soon as I even, you know, pretend that I'm going into his kitchen to do anything, he's like, no, 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 that's good. Look, I'm fine. I'll do it on my own. Don't do it. So in that instance, I, you know, you sort of have to be a bit sneaky and, and have people there to sort of keep him occupied while you do try to clean up as much as you can because otherwise he's going to be back on the on the street. So they do have to want it. Um, the other... Very important plan, as Michael said this morning, which I'm probably going to say a lot because Michael pretty much took my whole presentation away from me. Thank you, Michael. Um, is creating a plan. So it's about having whether they've got you know people coming at Christmas that they need to have their spare room cleaned out by. It's about being able to um, have the dining room table cleared so they can go back to having a meal with their family. There has to be some reason. Oh, they're getting evicted. There has to be some reason why they want to achieve this and you've got to keep on reminding them because it does get hard and if you can keep on saying, look, soon we'll have that bed under cover and you can, you know, we can set it up as a guest room or look how much you know, work we've done getting this table back together again, you've just got to keep on them all the time about sort of what their, what their goals are. And also have um, some sort of reward at the end, what's going to happen or maybe a consequence. So if they don't do this, What's going to happen? Well, maybe your children are going to be taking away. You, you, you are going to end up on the back on the street. There is, you know, there's always a, a, a pro and con. You're just going to keep that in your mind to keep going. You have to prepare them for what you're going to do. It's, it's going to freak them out totally because even though their house may already be in a mess, you're going to come in and cause absolute chaos just because you've got to sort through all their gear. So. Every time, um, you know, any sort of room, you've got to be able to clear out that room, sort the, all the items, and then put things back together again. But in that meantime, you are going to be causing a huge amount of mess. But if you if you warn them in advance and say, hey, look, you know, we're going to set this area in the, in the lounge room here aside, and we're going to pull everything out here, and we're going to do our sorting here, it's going to look bad, but I swear, you know, before I go home, I will make sure it's all back together again. And that way, they're prepared, and you don't sort of freak them out too much because it is, it is quite distressing. Um, as we mentioned earlier before, also have a plan for where things are going to go. So if they've gone through and made the hard decision about, okay, this is staying, this is going, this is going to my friend, make sure that at the end of the session you do have a place where they're to go. The last thing you want to do is for them to have gone through all this pain and making these decisions and then leaving the stuff with them because then it's still there, it's still in their face, they could actually go back and grab it if they so wish. So it's about having that plan in place. Where is this stuff going to go? Is it going to another family member, Vinny's, wherever? I think I've worked, walked totally out of my camera the whole time, so that's good. <laughs> You'd just be a scream of the voice. Um, okay, now this is the, the process that I uh, was talking about, pretty much what I do every time I go um, into a home. So the whole idea is to keep it as stress-free as possible, but to also keep it moving as quickly as they can work. So every time they pick up an item, they might pick up the clicker and go, oh, clicker. Mm, oh, I'll just decide about that later, and then they'll put it down. You don't want them to do that because all that's doing is just doubling your work. When they come to the clicker, say, okay, what are we going to do? Well, actually, tell me about this item. Tell me about the clicker. What does the clicker mean to you? And then they'll usually tell you the story. So there'll be a story about the clicker, how my dad gave me the clicker. It means this, it, it was the first clicker I had when I did my first presentation. Whatever it is, they have got to be able to tell you that story because without releasing the story, they can't release the thing. So again, as Michael said this morning, it's not about the thing. It's about what the thing means. What's the story behind the thing? So if they can share with you the story, then that's going to help them to maybe let it go going, oh, well, you know what, I really don't need this clicker. Um, this is where the three questions come into it. Do you love it? Well, it's a clicker. Why well, would I love the clicker? But is it useful? Well, it's useful for changing slides. Do I really need it? Well, well yes, I might be still need it because I still do presentations. So that could go into the keep pile. But if it's a, you know, if they can't answer yes to one of those questions, do you love it? Is it useful? 
do you really need it? Then it's time to let it go. And because you've already talked about the story, they've shared the story with someone, it's easier for them to let it go. It's when the story is still attached to the thing. And I mean, this is how we can't take a photo of the clicker. And so they've still got the memory of the clicker, but the actual clicker itself is gone. So it's about how we can honour what those things meant to the person without actually keeping the thing that's cluttering up the house. The next step is sorting. So as I said, you know, you've cleared out the room, you've got everything sort of uh, on the floor ready to go. It's about putting into piles. And again, I don't normally like to use the word throw because, again, it's not about throwing anything out. We're not here to clear out your house, we're not here to put it all in a skip. It's about allocating things into groups so then we can deal with it more easily. So I do have these types and I do use them. And if I do, for throw, you do things maybe like use tissues and things like that. But Every decision is their decision. So again, what are we doing with the clicker? Okay, we're keeping the clicker, it goes in the clicker one. No, we're donating it, it's going to the donating one. And then you move on to the next, the next item, keeping that momentum going. What you don't want them to do is go, the clicker, that belongs in my office. I'll just go and put that in my office. And off they go. Because once you've lost that uh, momentum with them in the room, and they go off because... When they go off, they might go, oh, there's a cup of tea that I forgot to finish drinking and I need to put that in the wash and they might lose focus. And you don't want that. You want to be able to keep the focus, which is why I have a relocate tub. And then, oh, this belongs in the home office. Well, then we'll pop it in that tub and then at the end of the session, we'll grab the tub and we'll go and deliver it to where in the house it's got to go. And that way, it's just keeping them in the room, keeping them focused, keeping on track. At the end of the sorting... Only the items in the keep tub are what is to be left or what's to be brought back into the room. So the throw, obviously that would go in the bin. The donate, I would take out to my car, which I'll explain later. The relocate, we go and take around to the wherever else it's got to go. The keep, that's what's coming back into that particular room. Some tips while you're doing the sorting and while you're doing the decluttering. For my... Again, I don't like to use the word holders either, but for, for my hoarding clients, usually a maximum of two hours is enough. It's, it's, it's very stressful. You don't want them to get um, disillusioned with it, that they're just going to you know, stop it all together. For clients where you're doing you know, their home office or their wardrobe or kitchen, four hours is fine. But even that starts to do their head in. But two hours is a good time because it's just enough to, to make a difference, but not too much that's going to overwhelm them. So always, I always keep my eye on their face and just see how they're going, how their eyes are going, what are they looking like, are they keeping a smile, you can sort of see in their demeanour they're starting to sag a bit, just watch their energy levels, just keep up the sort of encouraging words, going, how are you feeling now, would you like a cup of tea, would you like me to go make a cup of tea, have some water, even, you know, just sit down for a minute and just get your breath back, but always keep an eye on them because everybody's different and you don't know how far... Um, you know, things are going to push for them to make them stressed. The, yeah, like I said, the encouraging words. And even um, music, I find. Just saying, look, what sort of music do you like? Or do you have your own sort of music? But just having that sort of beat going in the background or something is enough just to keep them sort of rolling along. Um, so between the conversation and a bit of, you know, some, some beat in the background is usually enough to sort of keep, them, keep them on a roll. Now, everybody is organised in some way, shape or form. You've just got to find out with each client. It, every one of us is different and we might be a combination of different styles. But the first thing you've got to do is find out what sort of organising style your client has. And from there, pretty much everything flows. So go around the house and just have a look and see. You know, have a look in cupboards, have a look in their whatever area of the house. Because there's usually somewhere where they are quite organised. It might be the way they put their toilet paper. And from that, you get a bit of an idea of how they like to be organised. So when it comes to organising styles, it's pretty much just four main ones. One's insight. Now, insight means you like things on shelves. You like to see your books on shelves. You don't like them behind cupboards. You like to have your knickknacks out. You like to be able to see your collections. It's all about you like having things organised, but you like to be able to see them. The opposite to that is out of sight. These are people that get um, a bit um, antsy when there's too much clutter around. They like things behind doors. You know, you go into those houses, they're very minimalistic. They don't like things on their kitchen counter. They like things nice and streamlined and clean and just out of sight. And that works for them. It's in here somewhere. 
that's a style where um, that desk that Michael showed on his um, slide with all the papers in it. Now that is actually an organising style. It might look like it's out of control to the other person that goes to the desk going, what the hell is Bob doing? But Bob could go in and pull out his tax return from 1987. He knows exactly where it is. So to the, to the naked eye, we might just look like, think it's a bomb hit it, but actually it, it is an organising style and that's just the way that their brain, their brain works. And everything in its place. So this is sort of an a example of everything in its place. Everything has to be lined up beautifully. It's going to have its own spot. Again, it's one of those houses where if you were to go in and, and change the cushion around just for a bit of fun and the person freaks out, they like everything just so. And again, that's a type of organising style. And a big, a big point here is... Because a lot of people say, oh, look, you know, the, the organiser's coming around. I better go to pop down to Bunnings and buy 10 of those plastic tubs. You know, I have them here ready to go. But then as you're organising, you go, well, actually, you don't like plastic tubs. You like things away in a cupboard. So the plastic tub, you know, the label's on it. It's not going to work for you. So back to Bunnings with you and your plastic tubs. So wait until the end to see what organising style they've got. But also, you may have bought 20 plastic tubs and you've decluttered everything and they only needed the one. So again, the last thing you do is, is go um, and get the organising um, storage, I should say, the storage items. Now, this is a very important part of the process because again, you've gone through the hard, the stressful, the decision-making part of it. Now, what to do with the stuff? And now, Personally, in the way I run my business, I take anything that they've made the decision that's leaving the house, it comes with me. So I jam as much, and I've never left anything behind yet, I jammed everything I, I can into my car. I'll ring up the Vinnie's um, one or the Lifeline truck or whatever and say, okay, can you come and um, pick up some bigger items, but I'll make sure it happens within the next day or two. I always take it with me. And that goes with rubbish as well. If you think that um, you know rubbish in their bin might be pulled out, just... Take that, take that with you as well. So I will take the rubbish, I will take the donated items, just to honour the fact that they have made that decision and you don't want to be undoing that or leaving things in their place for them to, you know, again, start stressing about. Um, now, again, what Michael said this morning was about, you know, you can't just say it's going to Vinnie's. They, they go, well, who in Vinnie's is going to get it? You know, the people in Vinnie's might take it themselves. I need to know exactly what person it's going to, who's going to look after it. You know, if I've gone to this trouble of looking after it all these years, I want to now know it's going to Betty down the road because I know she'll love it. So always talk to them about, you know, do you have your own church? Do you have your own church? Do you have someone else that you want this to go to? And try your damnedest to get it to that person or to do whatever you can. But just to reassure them that's just not going out into the wild blue yonder where anyone can pick it up because that's not going to ring true. They need to know where it goes. Five minutes. Um, monitoring progress. It's about all the hard work, again, that they've done and that you've done. Make sure somehow it can be kept going. So whether that means um, putting a, a date in their diary before you go, saying, OK, I'm coming back next week and we'll do another half an hour. If you can get them to, even while you're not there in the, you know, in the home, they could do their junk drawer. They could look at their elastic bands and all those bags. They can just do something to keep the momentum going themselves. <laughs> Um, I always say to celebrate at the end of the session because it is hard work and you want to give them some sort of uh, reward for what they've done. So whether you say, okay, let's have a, you know, bring a cupcake and a, and a cup of tea or do something that just goes, yay, good on you, look what you've done. And again, those encouraging works, words really work well. Um, we were talking again this morning about the family and friends. And I always find that if they have some sort of relative that can just pop around and go, good on you, look what you're doing, you're making a big difference, you know, would you like me to help you do the elastic band draw while I'm here or something along those lines, having the support from family and friends really does make a big difference. And it just is not good to know there's someone accountable or there's someone who keeps them accountable, but there's someone there on their side sort of going, yay, look what you're doing, that's fantastic. And obviously, you know, it's a no-brainer. Check in once a week or how often you need to just to see how they're going. So just quickly, I'm sorry if I had to, to rush through it all here, but these are, and you'll get, if whoever wants a copy of the slides, you're, you're more welcome, but this is just about the basics on how to help someone. So do the assessment, make sure they've got a, a goal or a plan, handle each item only once, Tell me about, tell me about the clicker, tell me about the chair, tell me about, get them talking about what the item is about. Ask them quick three questions, love it, need it, um, useful. 
set the time limit, watch their energy levels, just make sure that they're not sort of flagging and then keep you on top of it, sorting the items into the groups, work out what their organising style is before you do anything else, try as best you can to remove the rubbish and the donated items from the premises, um, celebrate, give them a reward at the end, put a, a plan in the diary for the next session because then they'll start looking, looking forward to it or knowing it's there, sort of putting, again, the accountability, get that support, try and get them to do a little bit each day on their own so they get into the habit. It's about habit forming, how we, can we get them to regularly do it and just, yeah, keep in, keep in touch and see how they're going. Um, obviously, I don't have time to do the case study, so maybe if there's questions later on, yes. So I've got, um, again, I've got case studies from all different types of, of situations and things like that. So, and if you have your own sorts of case studies and you just want to ask me some questions, feel free. And if you want to do that during lunch, or that's fine as well. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so we're, I've, I've now got the, the pleasure of 